Thank you. So good afternoon, everybody. So I want to tell you a bit about statistical physics modeling to machine of machine learning. So you might be asking what does physics has to do with what we were talking about all today. So just to give you a little bit of pieces of history, how physics is related to machine learning. You know, the variational mean field inference that some of you are using for in statistical inference, it actually comes from physics, from the, we would call it the Gibbs, Bogolyubov, Feynman approach or variational method. Something like the Hopfield model that somehow stand at the, at the, at the roots of, uh, of some models in machine learning also comes from physics and was also solved in physics. Or the Boltzmann machine was called by Hinton and Sainovsky after the Boltzmann distribution that is used in order to, to train it. Then in, in physics, the probably most famous lady in, in um, applying physics to machine learning is Elizabeth Gardner. Who, um, who developed concept of the storage capacity, which is related to the VC dimension that we heard about in the previous talk. And also the support vector machines are actually based on, on, um, on a previous article from physics, as you can read in the original support vector machine papers. So with that, you know, recently I heard Jan Lecan saying that in one of the neural network winters, some of the few places where he could go and freely discuss the, the, the fun things that he was thinking about back then in 1885 about neural networks was actually in the physics community. So this is one of the summer schools that was running in Les Uches called Disordered Systems and Biological Organization and the snapshots, it's Lacan's paper in that, in that conference proceeding. So with that, let's jump to today. So today we are, are discussing deep learning with some of its theoretical challenging such as, such as, you know, why in deep learning we basically don't have overfitting, this kind of a picture that we all learned in when we are fitting a polynom to a line and we take too many parameters, then the generalization gets worse. But it's not true in, neural, in deep neural networks. The more parameters we get, the better the generalization gets. So how do we explain that theoretically or other things like was the generalization error. So the previous speaker was talking about the back uh, generalization bounds such, such as those based on the VC dimension on the Rademacher complexity. But in one sentence, those can be summarized that a network that can fit random labels should not be able to generalize. But in this paper that nowadays is very well known from two years ago by, by Ben Recht and collaborators, they actually show experimentally that the current deep, deep nets do easily fit random labels, yet they do generalize as well. So this theory totally doesn't explain that. And if those are maybe a bit more abstract questions to the practitioners, this one is really close to any practitioner. What's the sample complexity here really? So it has been mentioned today already at least twice that in the medical applications, for instance, we don't have as many samples of, as we have, for instance, in the sci-fi, right? In the sci-fi, you learn to distinguish images based on 50,000 samples. But also, as Joshua Benjo was mentioning, intuitively, a kid or child doesn't need 50,000 pictures of cats and dogs to actually learn to distinguish cat from a dog. So what is really the number of samples that is needed? So how do we attack these questions? So that's where maybe the physics come back, comes back, maybe, in the sense of, as Joshua said, that hopefully the laws of AI are as simple as the laws of physics. And that's maybe the reason also why us physicists could like join the collective effort to actually find these laws of AI. So, but the theoretical approach in physics is a bit different from, say, the theoretical approach in statistics or learning theory and mainly in our usage and understanding of what's a model. So if I, would, if I should summarize like the roadmap a theoretical physicist takes when we want to understand something, it could be summarized in these three points. So we first have some experimental observation or fundamental hypothesis. Nowadays in deep learning, we have a lot of empirical observations of what's going on, what are the things that we want to explain, okay? So one, we could consider done. So then two, in physics, what we do, we take a simple model, and often unreasonably simple model. This, that's not a typo, really unreasonably simple model. And then we work on the model, and even the toughest questions we have, we understand to death on that simple model. 
And only once that is done, then we go and say, okay, is that model realistic enough? Should we generalize it or not? What we see in there, is it universal in the sense that maybe the laws of physics do not depend on all the possible details. They usually depend only on some of the details. So of course, finding on which ones and what are the good models, that's kind of the art, but that's how it works. So just to, just to make it clear, in, in say data analysis or in statistics, the use of models is really different in, in the spirit, right? In, in statistics, so in Bayesian statistics, we have a model and we try to fit the data on the model. And if the model is such that it's not fitting well the data, then the model is bad. And we try to adjust it so that it fits well the data. So that's not the case in physics. In physics, we are happy with simple models that are, that are not describing the data, as long as they have interesting behavior, and as long as that behavior can be generalized to the more realistic case. Okay, so this is one, the biggest difference I think there is between the physics approach and the stat approach. We work with models that do not have to fit the data well, as long as they are interesting. And so was the stories in physics, you know, for instance, the model that, you know, is used to understand how magnetism works would be this, you know, summarized by this Hamiltonian and the probability measure, which we call the Boltzmann measure here, or the model used to understand how glassy materials work would be another Hamiltonian of, of this nature, and there are analogous models to understand the universe and the particle physics and all that. So is that useful in machine learning? So let me illustrate how that could be useful in machine learning. On the example of, a, so we could call it a single layer neural network, or in say, statistics it could be called the generalized linear regression, where I have a data set, X, so I have P is the dimension of each of the data points and N is the number of samples. And then I have some set of weights that I want to find so that the labels that I observe are fitted by some activation function phi to the data through these weights. Okay, so if you think of linear regression or logistic regression or phase retrieval or the perceptor network, all those are basically special cases of this single layer network. So now, so far, there is no model. So far, there's just a generic problem. So now, what is the model that we study in order to understand what's going on? I stated here, it's called the teacher-student model. It's, you know, it has been introduced a long time ago in, in the physics literature. And the way it works is that we take the data. Each element of the data matrix is IID Gaussian variable. Okay? So it's just noise. So this sounds crazy, right? But note that this, similar to this example that Joshua Benjo was giving us with this alien world, where they have communication through noiseless channels, and so they develop the language where they compress in the optimal way, and so what they are transferring is just random variables, okay? So now that world was possibly complicated, but now we make the world simple, we say that there is a teacher in our world that generates this, this vector V star, so there's a typo here, there should be a star, and takes this vector V star, multiplies it by the data point, puts some nonlinear function phi on it, and that's the label. So say sign, imagine a sign here, and, and generates the labels to each of the data points. Okay, and then what the teacher does, it gives us the data set and the labels. And to make it simple, it, he, she also tells us what this function phi. But the thing that she doesn't give us is the V star. Okay, so that's the learning model. That's basically the, you know, the aliens interact with their world with a very sim in a very simple way through these V stars, and our goal is to learn that rule. So are we able to do that? And now we want to be working in the high dimensional regime because that's kind of the regime in which most of the data we deal with live. So the dimension, the number of samples divided by dimension is some constant will be something like five. In the minute, it's something like 60, all right? And so what, okay, so we do that. So what did we win? So what we won here is that the thing that is usually intrinsically difficult, such as computing really up to a constant, the optimal performance for which you need to do the Bayesian statistics in high dimension, which is difficult. We don't know how to do that in general. But in physics, because the dimensions here is the number of particles, and in physics we always have many particles, 
actually 30, 40 years ago, we developed methods that tell us how to deal with the posterior probability distributions associated to such models. And these posterior probability distributions are just our Boltzmann measures. And these methods called the cavity method and replica methods come from 40 years ago, and we can use them to compute the optimal generalization error can be achieved in this model. Actually, back in those, those papers, that's what they did. So hopefully we moved from there a bit farther. That today, you know, these methods used to be this like dirty heuristic methods. Nobody knew really if it is mathematically valid or not. So the nice thing is today we know that they actually are mathematically valid and we also have algorithms that provably reach that performance in some well-defined regime. You know, these two results, you can read more about them in our, this year's cold paper. So, today there is, there is solid theory, you know, conference on theory of learning, hopefully publishes only solid theory. So, solid theory behind those results. And the kind of um, things you concretely get from that is, for instance, you take your weights here, you take them Gaussian random variables, and then you can plot, as a function of this number of samples per dimension, what is the error you are getting. And this, the red line would be the theory, the black dots would be the algorithm that provably should match the theory, so it does. And the blue dots, that would be, you know, we, in my group we are also big fans of scikit-learn, so just you take scikit-learn, you do logistic regression on this model, that's what you get. So in this particular case, you see that, that the black box logistic regression is basically doing as well as the optimal thing. So that's good, okay. But you can change things a little bit. Now you take the, the weights plus minus ones. You know, why not? It's your model. You're just playing with your model. And now something else is happening. Not much happens with the logistic regression. It's basically as the same generalization error as before. But the optimal curve jumps to zero at some point. And this algorithm we developed jumps to zero also, but a little bit later. And this green line is the prediction for what the algorithm should be doing. So that's just to check that we didn't make a mistake anywhere. And, and so you can observe here that, one, there is a gap between the current algorithms or the black box, the general purpose algorithms, and the optimal ones. But there is also a gap between what we think is the best algorithm and the optimal ones. And so this is something that we call the hard regime, and these jumps in physics will be phase transitions. That's why this slide is called phase transitions. And what's happening here algorithmically is basically the same reason why diamond stays diamond, because if you actually let it infinitely long, it would realize that it's much happier as a carbon, and it would just turn into carbon and release energy. But it's never doing that. It's perfectly happy as diamond for the same reasons for which the algorithms are perfectly happy with the crappy generalization error, even though if we were exhaustively searching for exponentially time, sampling our posterior, then we would get a good generalization. And this was you know, a simple example, but this year's, uh, at this year's NIPS, you can see actually a spotlight. Yeah, we were really proud about that. Uh, generalizing this approach to actually include hidden variables because, you know, so far it was a single layer network, no hidden variables. So we would like, you know, the first step is to go to the classical feed-forward neural networks with several um, hidden layers. So, so far, unfortunately, we can only do cases where the number of hidden units is order one, whereas the dimension of the data and the number of samples go to infinity together with a fixed ratio. So that's still kind of not the, like, we would like to be able to treat many hidden units, but that's where we are today. And in those cases, you can also observe like interesting behaviors such as phase transitions related to specialization, where the hidden units, if the sample complexity is too low, behave all the same. And then suddenly they realize that it's better for them to actually align with specific features in the data. And that's well delimited. But notice that the alpha, which is this sample complexity here, is something like 1, 5, etc. So in the real data that we are testing, like the list I said again, is more like 50. So we are way, way, way below that. So hopefully, you know, in the regimes where, say, some of, for some of the applications for which things are not working yet, they should be, stay, should be working. So my time is off. So just to say that there are also algorithmic gaps in this case. And I will finish with this slide where I somehow summarize what I was telling you. So 
So our goal is basically on these simple models and making them more and more realistic to have this region as a function of the simple complexity where th simply th information theoretically things are not possible than a region where from the computational complexity point of view things are not possible then the green region where we can do things today and then the blue region which is doable but where there is still a space for improvement of the current algorithms so quantifying these in different settings and designing those algorithms that would work in the blue region that's kind of our goal for the next few years. And with that, just a list of references, and I thank you for your attention.